In 1 Samuel chapter 17, many of us who have ever spent a day in Bible, uh, sorry, in Sunday school, you would have at one point in time heard this story. It is the greatest story that has ever been told about asymmetric warfare. The story about David and Goliath. There is nobody who comes to church who have never heard about David and Goliath. The Bible makes us to understand that this particular young man, a shepherd boy, he confronted a seasoned warrior. And it happened that that warrior to happen to be a giant. The Bible says that with faith and confidence in the God of Israel, with faith and confidence in the ability of God to be able to do the impossible, David brought down Goliath with a single stone. Bible makes us to understand that as the Goliath went down, the Philistine army were scattered. The children of Israel, the army of the children of Israel began the pursuit. And as they pursued, they won a resounding victory. Bible says that after that particular battle, the Lord God and the children of Israel were not having to, they were not going home. And as they were going home, the nation came out to welcome them. And as the nation came out to welcome, the women were doing what the women normally do. They started singing and they started praising God. And they were singing praises. Let's pick up the story from 1 Samuel chapter 18. Reading from verse number 6, the Bible says, now it happened that as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women had come out from all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with, uh, with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So in verse number 7, the women began to sing and to do what women do. And they danced and they said, they caused trouble for David. They said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David, he added some extra 10,000 to it. And Saul was pissed. That is God's version. Saul was very angry. And the Bible says that it displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000 and to me only thousands. The man killed thousands and he's still not happy. The man, and they ascribed thousands to me. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So David, I, sorry, so Saul, I, David, from that day forward. Interesting story. A guy killed the giant for you. A guy is under your command. The women were just singing just to make everybody happy. You already killed thousands. You killed thousands. David killed 10,000. And you feel because they did not put 10,000 in front of your name, you spoiled everything. That is, that is a very interesting story. Now, you will notice that last week we started talking about something that is very uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about. We started talking about the subject of failure. In our conversation last week, we looked at the meaning of failure. We look at how people react to failure. We look at the potential... We look at why people react the way they react when they hear the word failure. We look at the benefits of failure if you respond to failure correctly. We say that the difference between the man who wins and the man who fails is the way that particular person views failure and the way that person responds to the word failure. Okay, And today we are going to continue on the same subject. But we are going to take a step further. And we've been looking at why men fail. Why do men fail? Why do people fail? Why is it that the man who is exposed, who is given opportunity, who is given privileges, why is it that they are not able to make it? Why is it that children that are born into a very affluent society always find a reason to fail? Why is it that people are not able to make it in life? Why do men fail? This is one of the questions that has consumed the mind of so many people. A question that has consumed the mind of people who are well-meaning. And the, and, the, and the reason why this question consumed the mind of people is because, number one, a lot of us who are sitting down here right now, if we get down to it, we're afraid of failure. That's why that question is very difficult for people to deal with. Many of us are afraid of failure. Number two, many of us misunderstand the issue, this thing called failure. We... We define failure, in, you know, we define failure as an event instead of what? Instead of a process. We see failure as something that happens to you at a particular time. And that is why when a student fails an exam, he says, I have failed. No, you have not failed. It is not the exam that determines whether you fail or not. It is a process that led to that particular event. Number three, many of us, may, many of us for consider this question to be very troubling because we view failure we misinterpret failure. We misinterpret failure because we define failure on a, on, a, on a personal term. Not only that, we overestimate the power of failure. We think that once something happens to you, once you fail to be able to accomplish something, it is the end for you. And then finally, most importantly, many of us, you know, the question of failure is very difficult for a lot of people because many of us get stuck 
on our past failures. When something has happened to you in the past, when you are not able to cross a particular bridge in the past, when you have not been able to overcome something in the past, for some reason we get stuck in that place. So that any time we see that kind of situation present itself again, you get to remember and you are paralyzed. Many people are hung up on failure. And the question is why? Why do people fear failure so much? Why do people overestimate failure, the impact of failure in their lives? Why are people so hung up on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on their past failures? The reason is because, number one, when failure happened to many of us, we suck it in. We internalize it. We make it something that, you know, that becomes a burden upon our heart. Number two, we personalize it. We see every aspect of our life now as being a failure. The fact that you are not able to solve a mathematical problem does not mean that you are not going to be able to solve the problem of life. We personalize failure and that's why it becomes a problem. Not only that, we memorialize failure. In other words, we build a monument unto failure. Every time we are going out in the morning, we worship that thing. I have failed at this particular altar. I will not be able to make it forward again. Because I'm not able to do this, I'm not, be able to, I'm not going to be a success in life. And the people around us will continue to remind us of the things that we have done wrongly. And then they continue to tell you, because you failed in this area, you are not going to be able to make it in this area. We memorialize failure. And that's why failure is very difficult for a lot of people to handle. And you see, the question of failure is very real in the life of so many people. Because they are struggling with it every day. The question is that a lot of people are struggling with this particular issue and they are grappling with it on a daily basis. And the question is that many trying to find answers to the question of failure in their life. But the question still remains, why do people fail? Given all the opportunities, given all the, given all the, 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 the potential that is in them, given the environment that they have been given, why do men fail? Why do people fail? The answer to this particular question is a function of who you are talking to. It depends on who you are talking to. There are those who are conv convinced that the failure of men generally is because of a social problem. Because of where they are born. Because of the social environment. That is why men fail. Some people believe it's because of economic disadvantage. Because I'm not born into a rich family. Or they are not born with a particular last name. Or I'm not born with a particular skin color. That is why I am failing. Some people believe it's an environmental issue. It's because of the environment where I grew up. That is why I fail. Some people believe that it's a political Political issue, the political instability, because of the politics of the environment where I grew up. That is why I have failed. There are many people who even believe that there is a historical problem, and that is because of the colonization of Africa, or the tribalism in my area, or the genocide that took place in my in my community, or the racism that I'm experiencing in my community. And even in America today, we have coined a new one. We call it white privilege. Because of white privilege, that's why I have failed. Now, please understand. I am not saying any of these reasons are not valid. Don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that people do not fail because of their economic disadvantage. I am not saying people do not fail because of racism. I am not saying that people do not fail because of one reason or the other. Now, whilst all these reasons are valid for certain people, while they are valid for most people, I want to contend here this morning, I want to submit to you this morning, that beyond the physical and the external factors that we talk about, why people fail is deeper than that. Okay? The reason men fail is deeper than the fact that it's an economic issue. <laughs> It's deeper than it's, a, it's an issue of a social, a social injustice. It's deeper than the issue of racism. It's deeper than that. The reason men fail goes beyond the external physical factors. And I say that because, number one, you have seen people who have succeeded in the most difficult environment. We have seen people who have suffered great injustice and yet they have made something out of their lives. We have seen people who have succeeded well other people and they have been told that they will never be able to succeed. History is replete with those kind of people. Okay? And this, at the same token, we have seen people who have failed when they are given the biggest opportunity in life. We have seen people who are not able to take what they have been given and translate it into victory. We have seen people who have been born into wealth, but for some reason, they were able to squander the whole thing and mess up the opportunity that they have been given. So failure, I contend, must be, there's definitely more. If people can succeed in harsh conditions and people can fail in conducive environment, it must mean that there is another reason why people fail beyond the physical, 
beyond the economic, beyond the social, beyond the environmental, beyond the historical reason. There must be another reason. I'm not saying, please understand me, I am not saying that those reasons are not valid. I am not saying that the economic condition does not make people to fail. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there is something more. I'm saying there's another reason that might not be apparent to everybody. There must be another reason why men fail apart from the ones that we normally point to. And please understand clearly, like I said, I am not saying that you people, that, 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 that there is no racism, there is no uh, economic injustice, there is no social injustice. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying that there is more to the question. And that's why this morning I want to go a little bit deeper on the reason why men fail. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Bible tells us a story about the nation of Israel. The Bible says that when the nation of Israel, when they were originally formed, the intention of the Almighty God was that God wanted to be their king. God wanted to be the ruler and he wanted every one of them to be able to relate with him. He did not want any king. He wanted them to be a nation of priests, a nation of people who can talk to him. But one day, the Bible tells us uh, that the nation of Israel woke up one day and they decided uh, that they do not want the arrangement of the Almighty God. That they wanted a king. They demanded a king. Uh, and if you read the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8, reading from verse number 4, the Bible said that the elders of, the, uh, the, that the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and I said to him, look you are old and your sons do not walk in your way. Now make us a king to judge us like all other nations. In other words, they came to Samuel and they demanded for a king. And the Bible makes us understand that Samuel was not happy about that arrangement. Because Samuel knew the intentions of the Almighty God. Samuel knew that God wanted all of them to be a nation of priests. And so the Lord Almighty had to command Samuel. Say, give them what they want. And Samuel had to make the arrangement. He now gave it to them. By the time you get to verse number 17, God has identified the person that he wanted to make the king. He identified Saul. And in verse chapter 9 of... In chapter nine of uh, of uh, uh, sorry, uh, chapter nine of First Samuel, in verse number seventeen, the Bible says, "So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people.' In other words, the Lord Himself picked out Saul. The Lord Himself was the one that looked at Saul and said, "This is the guy that I want." This is the guy that I want you to, I want to be the, I want to be, make the king over my people. The Lord Almighty select, he was selected by Saul. He was selected by God, Saul. Saul was mentored by Samuel. In other words, that was, apart from Moses, Samuel is one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. He was not only selected by God, he was mentored by Samuel. He was a skillful man in battle. Not only that, he was a guy that was blessed with good looks. Just like me. Yeah. yeah. He was blessed with good looks. The man was tall. He was light. He was handsome. He was noble. I mean, when you look at him, you can see royalty written all over him. He had good genes. And not only that, he was beloved by his nation. The nation of Israel loved this guy because they wanted him. They were the one that requested him. And the Bible says that when this guy stood, he was head and shoulder, taller than every other person. The guy was massive. Good looking. That was the kind of a guy you see in front of a GQ magazine. You know, with the six abs, you know, but that's another story. But the point is that this was, the guy had a perfect stage for success. He had a perfect stage for success. He had a stage that anyone, nobody in Israel had. I mean, he was a man, you know, what more can you ask for? God himself picked you. You were mentored by Samuel. You are skillful in battle. You are good looking. And I mean, you are an eligible bachelor. I mean, the, the, the guy that everybody wanted to marry. And at the same time, the nation loved him. They were willing to do anything for him. Okay? What more can you ask for? The stage was set. The nation was what is beck and call. He was a man who had the opportunity to do great things. A man who was supposed to become great. A man who was supposed to write, you know, write his name in the sands of history that nobody will be able to change. But for some reason, Saul began to make some fatal error that turned his life around. He began to make a fatal error that eventually destroyed not just him as a person, but destroyed the kingdom that the Lord Almighty gave unto him. His life now came to a turning point in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And if you read from verse number 6, the Bible says, Now it happened that as they were returning home, when David was, run, 
were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tambourines and with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain thousands and David is ten thousand. Then Saul was very angry and the same... And the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000 and to me, they have only ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So they saw I, David, from that day forward. Which is very fascinating. Fascinating in the sense that here was a man who God himself picked and said, you are going to be a king. He didn't work for it. The Lord gave it to him. Here was a man who was mentored by one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Here was a man who was beloved by his nation. Here was a man who was an envy of everybody. Handsomely beautiful, beautifully handsome. You know, very good looking guy. And this same guy who had everything, the king of a nation, is now afraid of a shepherd boy. Isn't that interesting? The person who can tell them, you know, who commands the attention of the whole nation is afraid of a little shepherd boy. And the question is why? Why will a king be envious of a nobody? Why will a king be anxious, be threatened by an unknown shepherd boy? Okay? The answer to this particular question is the very foundation upon which the failure of Saul was built. Saul failed because of the answer to this particular question. And the same reason is why a lot of people are failing today. Because of the same reason that caused Saul to fail is the same reason why many people are failing today. And those who have studied the life of Saul, they have been able to find out and identify certain things that caused Saul to fail. One of the reasons why Saul failed was because he had this habit of making very poor decisions. And when he made those decisions, he made them in an emotional environment. Number two was because of his desire to always please other people. The Bible tells us that the Lord God Almighty gave him a command. He said, go and destroy the Amalekite. But because he wanted to please his people, he decided to spare some. The Bible, the, the, those who have studied the life of Saul, they said that Saul, if you read the scriptures... Very well. You will notice that David was always in the house of God praying. But you will never see anywhere written about Saul. That Saul had a relationship with the Almighty God. So one of the reasons that he failed, apart from the fact that he had a poor decision making ability, apart from the fact that he desired to please other people, the reason number three was because he had no relationship with the Almighty God that gave him the place where he occupied. Number four was because he had no, he had a problem uh, trusting the people who were close to him. He had no loyal associates because he distrusted everybody that was around me. Even his son, he distrusted, he distrusted him. And then finally, the problem of the, 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 the one of the reasons why Saul failed was the reason of jealousy. The Bible said that he was so jealous of David that he himself drove himself crazy. He did things that a king should not be doing. Every now and then he will promise that I will no longer pursue David, but he will end up pursuing David again because he was consumed by jealousy. Their soul could not stand the idea that another person was receiving more praise than himself. And many people in this room are failing because of that. There are many people in life who are failing because of that. Because you cannot see another person receive the accolade. You cannot, receive, see another, you cannot stand the idea that another person is getting the glory while you are not getting it. Now, while all these reasons contributed to the fall of the fall of uh, the failure of King Saul, I want to contend to you. I want to submit to you that the root of, of the failure of King Saul was much deeper than that. The root of the failure of Saul was much deeper than that. The root of Saul's failure lies in what I refer to as insecurity. He was so insecure that he was, you know, his insecurity led to his jealousy. Because he was insecure, he was jealous of David. Because he was insecure, he could not trust God, he could not trust man. Because he was insecure, he was willing to please people around him. Because of insecurity, he relentlessly pursued David to destroy him. Because of insecurity, he even almost killed his own son because of insecurity. In other words, Saul failed because Saul See, you know, Saul's failure was rooted in the insecurity he had for a little shepherd boy. And there are many, like I said, that are plagued with this particular spirit of insecurity. And that is why they will not venture. When they venture, they will give excuses. 
There are many in the church who are plagued with insecurity. The call of God is upon your life, but you will not act upon it because you are afraid. There are many who are, you know, who are so insecure that until that insecurity is dealt with, until, that, until, you, until you confront that insecurity in our life, failure will be very difficult to overcome. Because it's going to always be staring at your face. Okay? And the question this very morning is, what is this thing called insecurity? When we talk about insecurity, what am I talking about? When Saul was having this difficulty, what was he talking? What were we talking about? We're talking about insecurity is the uncertainty, the uncertainty and the anxiety that one feels about himself. It is the lack of confidence in your in, and faith in your own self. Insecurity is, say, is, thinking, is the thinking that you think to yourself. is what you say to yourself that you are incapable, that you are inadequate, that you cannot do something. It says that you are not good enough. You are telling yourself that you are not good enough, that you are not smart enough, that you are not handsome enough, that you are not beautiful enough, that you are not capable of doing anything. It's a feeling of inadequacy, a feeling of worthlessness, a feeling that yes, you are not good enough. And it happens in the life of an individual when that particular person is found in it, finds himself in an environment where they have this unhealthy comparison. Instead of you moving your life and moving forward, you are always comparing yourself to other person. When you see people who do that, you know there's insecurity going on behind them. And that's why Saul was able to be saying that, okay, they, they, they were giving him 1,000, they give him 10,000, they're giving me only 1,000. Why are you comparing yourself? When you have this unhealthy, un, unhealthy comparison, insecurities are play. When there's a desire to fit in, a desire to be accepted at all costs. And you see people who will do things, foolish things, just because they want to be accepted by others. When you see that going on in the life of an individual, you know insecurities are the way. When they are embarrassed by past failures. When they try to gloss over their failure, they like to present themselves as always, as, as always the winner. They want to let you know that they never make mistakes. You know that the insecurity is in play. When there is a pursuit for perfection, they always want to be right. They always want to be on top of it. They don't want anything to be out of place. You know insecurity is in place. And insecurity happens in the life of an individual when they are constantly berated by, by authority figure. When a father keeps telling the daughter, you will never fire. You will, ne you will never progress. When the mother keeps telling the son that yes, you will never amount to anything. When an employer says that you will fail, or you are not good enough, or you are ugly, and you are saying to that child as they are growing up every day that they are not good enough, they can never amount to something, they will never progress in life. What you put in that person is that particular feeling that that individual is not good enough, and they grow up becoming insecure. When you have a, a, a voice of authority speaking into the life of an individual, telling that person that they will never be good enough, you find out that, that insecurity will attend to that person. When the person who is supposed to affirm you, the person who is supposed to lift you up, the person who is supposed to build you up, if that person is the one knocking your head every day, knocking your head every day, you will find that you will grow and you will not have confidence in yourself. And that is what is going on here. The question is then how do you recognize insecurity? Number one, you recognize insecurity when you see a person who likes to project their own failure, who likes to project their own inadequacy into the life of another person. Have you seen somebody who says that you are controlling, but they themselves are the ones who are actually controlling? Okay? Have you seen people who say, oh, you are always rude, and you find that they are the ones that are always rude? The person who is insecure is the person who is an expert at projection. They project their own failure into the life of another person. The person who is insecure is a person who with extreme defensiveness. In never what they will never accept that they make a mistake. The Bible says that when Samuel went unto Paul, he went unto Saul and told him, he said, Saul, why have you done this? He said, no, it is because of the people. He never accepted that particular, he defended his position. The Bible makes us to understand that at one point in time, he was actually blaming Samuel. He said, you say you are coming, but when I waited for you and you did not come, so that's why I did what I did. In other words, it's not my fault, it is your fault. When you see people who are always extremely defensive, you know there's insecurity going on. When you see people who are always very quick to brag, they are quick to be able to exaggerate. They are quick to drop in names. Every small thing, you know, was when I was with the governor, when I was with the president, when I was with uh, so and so, I was with uh, LeBron James. I was, and they start dropping all those stupid, useless names. At the end of the day, you know that this person doesn't know Jack. It's just an empty, it's just an empty barrel. When people are prone to bragging and exaggerating, you know that they are insecure. When people are very good at belittling the success of other people, somebody has done an excellent work. They have done a very good job. You say, ah, what has he done? After all, what has he done? 
I can do better than that. In the days when I used to be myself, you know, that is like, this is the thing that we do it blindfolded. I will do it blindfolded. When they are boxing, how does it fight? If I tie my right hand at the back and box him and give him a knockout with my left hand, that they will always belittle the success of other people. That's because they themselves are little inside. Not only that, they are the people who are very good at excusing failure. Insecure people like to demonize and diminish the success of others. They rejoice in the failure of other people. They want to see other people fail. If in the heart of an individual, your joy only comes when you see the other person's misfortune, you got a problem. Serious problem. So when you see people doing this, you know they have a problem with insecurity. And the trouble is that insecurity is dangerous to the well-being of an individual. It destroys you. The reason is because, number one, insecurity will alienate you. In other words, it will isolate and separate you. You have heard me say from this pulpit several times uh, that when you behave like a jerk, a lot of people walk away from you. When you are too hypersensitive, when you become a high demand person, when you are the, when you are a high maintainer, when you're in a high maintenance relationship, people begin to isolate you. People begin to walk away from you. People begin to separate from themselves from you. Insecurity does that to you, alienates you from the place where you're supposed to get what you're supposed to. Number two, it imprisons you to your own problem. In other words, it builds a wall around you. When you are insecure, you are so afraid, you are so insecure, that what you do is that you never try to venture out of that your secure zone. You are locked up in your own prison. And at the end of the day, you are not able to do the things that God wants you to do. You have a lot of vision. You have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of ideas. Uh, there are a lot of things that you have the potential to do. But because of insecurity, because of yourself, uh, your feeling of inadequacy, because you think that you are not good enough, you are not able to step out and do those things. So you are imprisoned. By your own, you know, ideas and by your own insecurity. Number three, insecurity stagnates you. In other words, as you are making progress, you get to the point. Uh, and you remember that the last time I failed at this point. You get to that point and you freeze. I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but there was a time when I was in my fifth grade. There was a teacher that thought that I was good at speaking. And then he enrolled me to be, a debate, to be in the debating team. <laughs> Gave me a topic, teachers are better than farmers. And we went in there, I was supposed to be a supporting speaker. The young man that was going to be our first speaker for our school at that time, I still remember his name. His name is Leo Odom. Leo is an excellent speaker. He came in and he spoke very well. And then I was supposed to come in and give a closing argument. I opened up and I was supposed to speak for two minutes. Two minutes. You won't believe that was the longest two minutes of my life. <laughs> I stood there and I froze. I just froze. Everything that I've written down, everything I've probably prepared to say, I just, it just disappeared. I just stood there. My legs were just getting so weak, I couldn't carry myself anymore. Leo had to come and rescue me. Okay? The point I'm making is that if you now build a monument to that particular experience, you will never be able to speak in public anymore again. And that is why a lot of people can't speak in public. Not because they don't know what to say. Not because they are not smart. Not because they are not intelligent. Not because they are not articulate and they are very, you know, they can, they can present themselves. It's because at one point in time, something has happened in the past and they has kept them stagnant. And as a result, that insecurity, the fear that I'm not good enough, the fear that I cannot deliver, the fear that I'm going to freeze, the fear that I will not be able to do it the way my other people expect me to do, freezes them, it stagnates them. They are not able to make progress again in life. And not just in the area of speaking, in every other area. You have invested in money, you have done one particular business and you lost that money. You are afraid to put your money in there. You have gone into a relationship and somebody cheated on you and that relationship went back. You are afraid of getting into a relationship. You are, you know, there's a particular job that you did and you didn't do very well. You refuse to apply for other job. The point, it, it goes on and on and on in different aspects of life. It stagnates your life when you allow insecurity to take hold of your life. Not only that, it divorces you. It eats you up. It sucks life away from you. Because there are things you want to do. There are things that your heart longs for. There are desires that you want to accomplish. But because of fear, you are standing there. And you are watching life pass over. You are watching people enjoying themselves. You are watching people live their lives. You are watching people fulfill their dreams. You are watching people go on and doing better things. You desire it, but you can't. Because it sucks out life from you. It sucks out energy from you. It sucks out the willingness to move on. It sucks out that encouragement. It sucks out that energy, that, that motivation. It sucks it away because of your fear. 
And not only that, it now destroys you. It destroys relationship because you want to hold on tight to the things that you have. And because you are holding tight, you choke your relationship. I don't know whether I've ever been with people who are always, you know, they are always hovering you. They want to be with you. Because you are your friend, you cannot be the friend of another person. And they become so, they become so, 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 so overwhelming that you say, no, I don't want this relationship anymore because you are choking me. You are not allowing me to breathe. That is what insecurity does for you. You have it between parents and children. Because they have suffered one particular disappointment or the other in the relationship, they now begin to hoover around the children. They don't even allow the children to breathe. You see it in relationship. Husband has been disappointed by a wife, by a former, in a marriage, in a former marriage. He now becomes so jealous of the wife, he will not allow the wife to even breathe. The wife is doing the same thing. The boys are doing the same thing to girls. Girls are doing, I mean, it is all over. It destroys relationship when you allow insecurity to take hold. The question this morning is, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse number 1. The Bible tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good, an acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you overcome? How do you deal with insecurity in your life? How do you deal with insecurity in the life of people around you? The first thing is that that person must give their life to the Almighty God. You have to give your life to Christ. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Give your life to the Almighty God because it's the one that wrote the blueprint of your life and it's the one that can correct it. Give your life to God. Number two, you have to embrace his view for you. What does the Lord say about you? Remember the praise worship that we had? He said, I am who you say I am. Okay? In other words, there is a vision that God has had, that the, God, that the Lord Almighty God has for you. There is a picture that God has of you. There is something that God wants to make out of you. When he created you, he had a master plan. He had an idea. He had a goal. There's a reason why you are born. You have to embrace that reason. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, I'm not an accident. I'm not the, I'm not the product of evolution. I'm not a monkey that became, you know, that became wise that, yes, I begin to walk around in shirt and suit. No. I'm a child of God. You have to embrace the view of the Almighty God. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Embrace what God Almighty calls you to be. Number three, you say you have to embrace nonconformity. He said, do not be conformed to this world. You know what? Don't try to be acceptable by force. Don't try to be like the Johnson, the Joneses of the world. Don't try to make yourself into what God has not made you. There's only going to be one me. If you try to be me, you can only the best thing you can do is be number two. If I try to be you, the best I can be is a number two. The Bible makes us say, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to the system of this world. Do not be conformed to the way this world thinks. Do not be conformed to the way this world operates. It says, do not be conformed to this world. That is the way you break free from insecurity. You see what yourself, the way God sees you, and you begin to conform to the way God Almighty wants you to conform. Number four, he said, then you renew your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. But be it transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? It means that you begin to feed your mind with the word of God. Because it tells you this is what you are. And it begins to give you the strategy of how to become who God wants you to be. You begin to renew your mind. You begin to take out the old garbage. The lies that you have been told. That a man can only be beautiful when he begins to walk like this. That a man can only be, that a, that a girl can only be good when they paint up all their body. That a man, you know, that you can only be acceptable in a particular way. You begin to take away all those garbage and begin to take in the image of God. He said, renew your mind. Feed your mind with the right stuff. How do you lose weight? How do you become the person, how do you become a perfectly, you know, you are being a perfect health? You stop eating the junk food and you start eating healthy. Okay? You start taking out all the trash and you start doing what? Filling your life with the right thing. The same thing in your spirit. If you are going to get rid of insecurity, all those things that solidify insecurity in your life, all those thoughts, all those actions, you say begin to push them aside and begin to replace them with the word of God. Begin to replace them with the things that, that is why it is extremely important for you to know how to read the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you don't know what the Lord God Almighty is saying about you. So he said, renew your mind in his word and then live out the word. 
James tells us that it is a very foolish idea for you to read the word of God and just walk away without practicing it. Say so you don't get the benefit by just hearing. It is good for you to hear. Don't, miss, don't, don't, miss, don't, 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 don't get me wrong. But the benefit and the blessings come when you put it into practice. You have heard me say this. John chapter 1, I think in verse number 12 or 14. It says that, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Even the glory of the only begotten son. The Bible makes us to understand that the only time the glory of the word of God comes into your life. The only time you see the benefit of the word of God. The only time you enjoy the benefit of the word of God is when you put it into practice. And the Lord is saying, if you are going to deal with insecurity in your life, you leave out the word of God. The word of God says you should live in faith. The word of God says you should step out in faith. The word of God says you should trust him. The word of God says that you should not pay too much attention to yourself. But begin to pay attention to the things of God. Live out the word of God. Begin to step out of your comfort zone. Begin to do the things that Peter did. The Bible says that when Peter saw Jesus walking upon the water. He said Lord if it is you let me step out. And Peter stepped out into the unknown. The point we are making is that you have to live out the word of God. And to live out the word of God means that you have to believe that word. It means you have to trust that word. It means that you have to be convinced that that word is true. I've told you the example before and I will share with you again. The chair that you are sitting on right now. If you do not believe that this chair is strong enough to carry your weight, you will never sit on it. You will not. And the same thing, unless you believe the word of God. Unless you are confident about the word of God. Unless you are sure about the word of God, you will never act on it. You will not even trust it. You will not put your life on it. You will not do things that will, you will not put your life, you know, you will not, you will not order your life based on that word. The word of God, to live out the word of God, you have to first of all know that word and you have to believe it. And you have to be convinced that it is meant for you. Now when you deal with insecurity in your life, what it does for you is that it unstops your life. When you deal with insecurity in your life, it takes away the excess baggage. When you deal with insecurity in your life, the cycle, of, the cycle of failure that you have been used to, it comes to an end. When you deal with insecurity in your life, you now begin to see a freshness, a health that flows from your body. And please understand that failure in life is not only a function of what is going on out there. It's a function of what is going on in here. Okay? Failure is a function of what is going on in your head. It's a function of what you are thinking. If you think that you are incapable, if you think that you are inadequate, if you think that you cannot do something, if I give you the opportunity, you will find that it's a question of time you will fail. Because you already believe that you cannot succeed. But if for some reason you are convinced that you can succeed, that you can make it, that you can be a success in life, you will find out that before long, everything you lay your hands upon to do will begin to prosper. And that is why the Bible tells us, and I want you to, and I'm going to be closing with this. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter 23. If you read from verse 7, it tells us, the first part of it says, for as he thinks in his heart, says, so he is. In other words, whatever is going on in your mind is what determines how you live your life. Whatever is running through your brain is how you shape your life. So men fail, not only because of economic hardship. Men fail, not because of only social injustice. Men fail, not because only of political unrest. Men fail, not, because, not only because of colonialism or apartheid or whatever the issue might be going. Men fail because of what is going on in their head. If you think that you can do it, then you can do it. If you think you cannot do it, you will not do it. The reason men fail is, not de is because deep down, they are convinced that they are incapable of success. That's why we fail. Because if you don't believe it, it will never happen. Okay? The question this morning that I have for us before we pray is what do you think about yourself? What do you think about yourself? Do you see yourself as being a capable person? Or do you see yourself as incapable? Do you see yourself as a success in life? Or do you see yourself as the, that you will not be able to make it? Do you believe that uh, the conditions out there is enough to stop the will of God for your life? Or do you believe that regardless of what the world throws at me, that what the Lord God Almighty says about me is what is going to be happening? What do you believe about yourself? That is the question. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.